Yes, Miller. We will start right now. Good afternoon. On behalf of Department of Microbiology, PN Medical College and Nair Hospital, I welcome to the relevance of fungal infection in clinical practice. I thank, I special thank the faculty and all the delegates who have taken their valuable time out to participate today. I will now in invite Program Director Dr. Jayanti Shastri, Professor and Head Department of Microbiology, PN Medical College, Nair Hospital, Mumbai, to give the introductory remark. Over to you, Dr. Jayanti. Very good afternoon to all of you. It is indeed my privilege. Actually, it is of a proud privilege that Dr. Aruna Lok Chakravarti, who is a legend and all of us know that we call him the father of mycology, has agreed to speak at the academic sessions of the centenary celebrations of our medical college, that is TN Medical College and BYL Nair Hospital. To give you a brief about the centenary uh, celebrations, the hospital was actually conceptualized in 1921 by Dr. Sate and Dr. Barkamkar. That was the time when India was under the British rule. And it was very difficult for Indians to pursue medical education. And even the faculty were not Indians. So it was that era when the institutes were conceptualized. And in 1925, we got almost five acres of land from Dr. A.L. Nair, and the hospital in his mother's name was established by La Yamuna Bai Lakshman Nair Hospital. That is why we are the B. by L. Nair Hospital. Later, Topiwala Desai gave five lakhs of rupees for setting up the medical college, the Topiwala National Medical College. Ever since then, we have just not looked back. We have a number of firsts to our credit and we have been marching in progress. And this year from September, 2020 to September, 2021, we have been having a number of academic programs uh, under the ages of the centenary celebration. Of course, we all know 2020 is the year of the microbiologist, year of the pandemic, and how all of us have put our best foot forward to fight this pandemic. And the year 2021 can be earmarked as the year of vaccination against COVID. But then came the variants. So with the variants came the focus in fungal infections with special reference to the mucormycosis. With these few words of introduction, I request Dr. Sa uh, Sarika to please play the introductory and welcome remarks of our Director of Medical Education and Dean Topiwala National Medical College, Dr. Ramesh Bharmal. As his day is packed with meetings and other commitments, he has sent a special video to be played on this occasion. Good morning. While fighting with novel coronavirus, the medical fraternity had come across a lot of challenges. We are about to gather information about COVID and strengthen our fight and the another issue in the form of mucomycosis has come up in recent times, which brought mycology into limelight. The biodiversity of microfungi and macrofungi is very large and still unexplored. Treatment modality are also challenging due to their vast biodiversity and also limitation due to scanty 
research and cost of the medicines like liposomal amphotericin B. The majority of Asian physicians managing fungal infections do not have formal training in medical mycology. Laboratory support for mycology is not widespread. It is the matter which need to be addressed on priority basis. The majority of physicians managing an invasive fungal infection could not use the drug of choice because of cost, though most claim to follow international guidelines. Dr. Arnaloke Chakrabarti will share his views on relevance of fungal infection in clinical practice. I am thankful to Dr. Shastri and her team of microbiology who have brought up this platform for all of us as part of centenary year celebrations as Nair is completing its 100 years. It is, a, it is always a delight for microbiologists to listen to well-known speakers like Dr. Chakravarti. I hope all of you will also enjoy this. I wish all the best to this program. Thank you and enjoy the trip on the mycology. Thank you very much. Thank you to Dean, sir, for his uh, words of encouragement. In fact, he has been encouraging us all through the year to have number of academic uh, programs. And we had one on um, the genome sequencing and pandemic preparedness. We are having a webinar series on uh, dissertation to publication. And uh, today we have all uh, come together to listen to our dear stalwart, Dr. Aruna Lok Chakravarti. I have the pleasure of introducing Sir. Uh, I need to share the screen. Sharika. Please share the screen, ma'am. I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Aruna Lok Chakravarti. He is the professor and in charge of the Center of Advanced Research in Medical Mycology, the WHO Collaborating Center for Reference and Research of Fungi of Medical Importance and National Culture Collection of Pathogenic Fungi. He's also the head of the Department of Medical Microbiology at the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research at Chandigarh in India. Sir is the current president of the International Society for Human and Animal Mycology, ISHAM, past president of CHAM. The most important thing about Sir, and I would say that he's a guiding light for all of us. Jokingly, once uh, long back when I met him, I told him, Sir, if I had met you first, I would have become a mycologist. I wouldn't have thought of working in virology. He has consistently helped in the development of the discipline of medical mycology. We have all seen Sir so passionate about developing this discipline. And he has in fact uh, conducted so many trainings for laboratories across India and member countries of CRO and WHO. He has set up laboratories all over. His major contribution is in the field of epidemiology of fungal sinusitis, then sporotrichosis, mucor mycosis, and hospital acquired fungal infections. His laboratory is recognized as a center of advanced research in uh, medical mycology in India. It is, was initially sponsored by WHO and the WHO Collaborating Center for Reference and Research on Fungi of Medical Importance. 
he this is again very important he is a curator of national culture collection of pathogenic fungi so this is actually very important because uh, we in our departments we struggle a lot to in fact maintain cultures so if there is a, there is a national center from where we can source that is actually very very good uh these are his um, additional uh, i would say uh, all the stars all stars are uh, you know marked with number of publications the books they write then the um, uh, editor of two books in fungal infections in asia and clinical practice of medical mycology he has received multiple awards fellow of the national academy of medical sciences fellow of the national academy of sciences of india and fellow of the european confederation of medical mycology and fellow of the infectious disease society of america sir these three slides are not enough to describe you but i would like to just say four important things about sir number one he has been extremely passionate about his work he has been a guiding light a source of inspiration and motivation to all of us and all in all he is a legend for us and we are very fortunate to have you sir over to you sir thank you dr janti too much of good words i don't know how far it would be uh, useful in that sense can i uh, have sharing my slides you have to stop share these slides and then i can share yeah i would request all of you to just the group otherwise there would be a lot of sounds which would be i would request all of you to remain mute or till only as there is some emergency or some important question you want to ask in that sense there is one person already raised hand dr usha rai i'm not sure whether she wants the question just now or later okay uh, <clears throat> at the outset i like to thank dr jayanti dr lona and the whole institute tn medical college and nair hospital dean and other people for giving me this opportunity of discussing fungal infection in the forum where the clinician and microbiologist really bridging together good afternoon ladies and gentlemen who have come to attend this particular session that jayanti has given me a very challenging topic that is relevance of fungal infection in case of clinical practice i like to start with how much we were familiar in case of fungi you know human indirectly aware of fungi since the first loaf of liver bread was baked or the first cup of grape turned into wine but that time in, in case of agriculture people were really getting the challenge because of the rust fungi so romans designated it as a deity so that the god of rust may be pleasant and at least the agriculture can grow they used to organize annual festival which is called robigelia in his honor but then people came to understand or people identified fungi and found fungi is everywhere not only on agriculture it's on soil it's on air lakes it's in air it's in lakes rivers seas plants animal food clothing human body where it is not it also breaks the organic matter releases the carbon oxygen nitrogen phosphorus in the atmosphere which helps in case of human we eat fungi mushroom is a quite delicious one moral truffles even those who are vegetarian looking for good protein now fungus is giving protein called mycoprotein and those who are uh, molecular biologists or looking into the cell they first started in case of eukaryote fungi is the so called simplest one to understand about the biology but the fungi also came into importance because of producing the drugs you all know of the penicillin which had come from the penicillium notatum by alexander fleming 
And then there are many other drugs that come from fungi. But the same fungi in year 2012, nature has given this in the nature journal has said, emerging fungal threat to animal, plant, and ecosystem of health. Said that 72% of the animal species are going to be extinct or plants are going to be extinct. Even in the next year, 2013, in the same journal Nature said that it could happen in one night. And out of the four things which can cause planetary disaster, one is possibly death by fungal epidemic. Already we got a test from this mucormycosis, which had really caused a big problem in case of India. Even then, people were not so much concerned. So Nature Microbiology in 2017 in the editorial state, stop neglecting fungi. Because already it is known that 300 million people suffer from serious fungal infection. And annually, 1.6 million people die, which is more than malaria or tuberculosis death. But we have not paid so much attention. Even fungi destroy the crops, which could have fed nearly 600 million people. In spite of that, whether it is media, whether it is politicians, whether it is funding agency, nobody is to care for fungi. They were sleeping on this issue. So let's look into directly into the human fungal infection issue. I would say, though the concern is recent, but within short period provide a formidable challenge because of high magnitude of the problem. We are seeing new host susceptibility, new agents. The fungus is difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. So everything problem. And in developing country, the problems are much more because of shortage of everything. Awareness is a problem, laboratory is not there, manpower is not there, antifungal drugs are not available, even if it is available, People cannot afford it. And this is the estimate in eight Asian countries where it has shown that more than 2 million serious are there. With this little background, let's look into how fungal disease is relevant in case of clinical practice. Whenever I used to think about how I'll go with it, my friend Rajiv Swan comes in my mind. If I would have given this topic to Rajiv, you would have started with cases like this. This is SKAML for induction chemotherapy like this. You will go on this way. But I was just wondering, this is a mixed crowd. What I would like to say and what they are interested in. So this was the relevance of this disease was a big issue, which I was... Sir, uh, hello. Please unmute yourself. Please. Yes, sir. I have to force mute it somehow. So, which relevant with the doctors, I was thinking. You know, fungal infection at the beginning, it was relevant for the dermatologists. They used to see the ringworm or sometimes the petriasis versicular infection. And they were the thinking that this is the problem only about the dermatologist. But then in 1980s, when the AIDS came, and also the hematologist and transplant doctors found that there are, because of immunosuppression or chemotherapeutic agent, there are immune suppressed patients are there where fungal infection is important. So they were the people who used to deal with fungal infection. But in recent years, whether it is physician, ID specialist, pulmonologist, intensivist, gynecologist, even the surgeons, they are becoming concerned of fungal infection. Now, I was thinking who may remain who are not concerned about fungal disease. I was thinking about the psychiatrists, that would be the only group. 
But then I found that even in the psychiatry in John Hopkins, it had been shown in news publication, candida yeast infection are more common in a group of men with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. Delusions of disseminated fungus. And following that, I have heard that many of the conferences of the psychiatrists, they have discussed about fungal infection. So fungal infection is concerned everyone. Now it has become a bit complicated in the clinical practice. Look in these dermatologists. They were very much happy with treating this uh, tinea infection, innocuous infection, very quickly could be treated. But suddenly, in last few years, we are seeing great Indian epidemic of superficial dermatophytosis. The tarbinafine is a wonder drug in dermatophyte where it is becoming 30% resistance. And you see this type of disease, which we started looking at it, extensive disease. We used to teach the students that there is a single ring form which is being there, but we are now seeing two rings which are there. Why, what happened? What is the reason? What is the reason is here that the drugs which we are using, the quadridrum, where we are giving antibacterial, antifungal, anti-inflammatory, as well as steroid. This has created such a huge problem that throughout the world, people are concerned about what is happening in India about dermatophytic infection. Now coming to these people who are uh, dealing with the AIDS patient, I would say this is one disease identified in 1984. Within 25 years, this is the first infectious disease where they planned for elimination. So even AIDS target that we should have zero AIDS death by 2013, but there is only 15% reduction. So they have moved the goalpost. They have removed this target. They have gone 2030. But David Denning said, you cannot do even then because your curve is going like this. You have to reach here. <coughs> this year, the problem is these four fungal infections, which are causing around 70% deaths. So how we can control this group of infections? Once, if we can improve the fungal diagnosis, now in case of cryptococcus, we have got a lateral flow assay. Similarly, if we can have point of care test for histo, pneumocystis, talomyces, emarjomyces. I'll come to this emarjomycosis. It's a new disease which I've joined in case of this AIDS patient. Strategized screening of the patient less than CD4-200, but whether it is available in low middle income countries where the disease is more. And we need to include this fungal diagnostics in the essential diagnostic list of WHO. In case of therapy, yes, preemptive therapy by screening is important. We need to look into the drug availability and affordability. We have to monitor the resistance and we have to give the optimal ART timing because there is also the problem of inflammatory disease which comes into it. But friends, last week, this particular study had come. This from Guatemala, which had shown that during COVID-19 pandemic, the diagnosis of opportunist infection decreased by nearly 50%. It's not because the opportunist infection decreased, because death due to opportunist infection has increased by 10% because we are so overwhelmed by COVID-19 that we lost, not only in case of the AIDS, many other diseases where we are not taking care. Emarjomycosis is a very interesting disease about few years back, it came in case of South Africa, and it found that those who are having CD4 count by less than 50, they have polymorphic skin lesions, skin biopsy, and you can see that even in the blood culture, you can have it, it is present in the soil and air of South Africa. Then this is from Delhi, Dr. Kapoor. She sent us some of these uh, slides. These are the two patients. Both of the patients have HIV. Initially, by looking at the histopathology, you can start thinking this is histoplasmosis, but there is no tuberculate macroconidia. When the sequencing had been done at our lab, we found this is closer to immune. This is emarjomyces pastudrianus. So friends, 
be careful, look into your slides. It may be histoplasma, some of them, which you have diagnosed, maybe emergomycosis, which is there. Going into the traditional group of hematologists and transplant physicians, what they are now doing, more immunosuppression, unrelated transplantation, immune modifying drugs. And because of that, what it had been seen in certain group of patients, there is very high infection rate which have been there. So they are giving profile access in this group. But when you look into the Indian data, it is much higher. What might be the reason? Even the diagnosis is delayed longer time of remission. My presumption is that basically in public sector hospital, we cannot have HEPA filter room everywhere. Of course, in bone marrow transplant, we do have HEPA filter room. But when in an AML patient, we are doing the induction chemotherapy that is done in case of general wards. Looking to the transplant group, especially in India now, transplants are increasing in number, liver, lung, heart, bile. Of course, we have got very high number of kidney transplant. Here, what we are now seeing, the infections are coming later. Even, even beyond two years, there is the infection which is happening. So how do you plan profile access in this group? Initially, in the neutropenic group, people are concerned of invasive candidiasis, who started fluconazole. But then there are resistance species in Mars and slowly invasive mold infection increased in number. Then they changed the plan, started with the mold active prophylaxis. So now we are seeing breakthrough mold infection like mucormycosis. Emergence of the triazole resistant aspergillosis which are coming. So friends, when we are planning any prophylaxis, these are the six questions you must ask yourself what I am trying to prevent, who should receive the prophylaxis, what agent should be used, how long we should do the prophylaxis, what are the potential side effects, is there any safe alternative to prophylaxis? Coming to the ID physician or general physician, whether it is superficial to deep, everything is in their domain. And because of this, they have to deal with almost whole book of fungal infection when they are dealing with their patients. Pulmonologists, pulmonologists basically, they uh, look into the fungal infection because all other than yeast, they enter via, whether it is mold or dimorphic fungi, they are entering via the lung. And because of that, they are getting concerned. Immunosuppressed patients, they used to suffer earlier, but now new these groups which have come. But one area where they're very much concerned is aspergillosis. You see, this particular infection is very interesting. When there is immune dysfunction, we see invasive aspergillosis. When immune hyperactivity, we see all the allergic disease. Even when there is lung damage, there is chronic pulmonary aspergillosis, which is there. Several terms were coined here to describe the chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. So what we did is that I was also part of this group, worked together, and we have clubbed them together under one group of chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. Now, this particular disease is quite common in India because post-tuberculosis, if you see that chronic pulmonary aspergillosis is a very important issue. Patients generally, after treatment, if they recur the symptoms, we generally consider either resistant tubercular bacilli, or we consider that there is a new infection. Nobody thinks about, can it be chronic pulmonary aspergillosis? Because post-tuberculosis treatment, there may be small cavity where the aspergillus colonizes. Second important thing is the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. This particular definition shows that pulmonary disorder caused by immunological reaction mounted against aspergillus fumigators colonizing the tracheobronchial tree of the patients with asthma with little or no tissue invasion. Now, we started looking at these cases since the 80s in few numbers, in large numbers. So then we developed a working group. And here you can see all the eminent people also were there. We all together first time developed a diagnostic proper criteria and classification. 
Then we have estimated the burden of this particular ABPA, and we found that more than 500,000 cases are there in case of India. Now going into the intensivist group, intensivists are a big group now. ISCCM is a big conference, and I always first start with this slides for them. You see, this is a study which had been done almost 14 years back, but this particular study had been conducted in 75 countries over 1,000 ICU. It showed that in case of the ICU, out of all infection, 20% are because of the fungi. And now there is the superbug candia oris has really developing and creating problem. But challenge with the intensivists is that their awareness of fungal disease was limited. They used to, their mindset used to say that only candida infection occurs, mold infection does not occur. But I highlight a very old paper of 2006. It shows that out of invasive aspergillosis, more than or nearly 50% of these cases are in intensive care unit. Now we have these two papers, multicentric study, which have been published in case of the ICU. This has given a clear picture what is happening in case of India. This is a bit older uh, data of 2015. And this particular study was conducted in 27 ICU, which showed that younger patients, they acquired the infection much early. And even with less morbidity, they acquired the infection. So in India, if you have to control this invasive candidiasis, you have to intervene quite early. That is very important. As well, resistance has nearly 12%, which is very high, high mortality. And it's not the five species are important, rather vast spectrum of species in India is important. So you imagine if you do such type of multicentric study, you bring out the picture of epidemiology of India. Another interesting thing which we have observed in case of India is that, especially we have observed in pediatric ICU, multiple outbreak. Can you imagine 379 babies suffer from bloodstream infection because of one particular fungus, Pichia anomala? I first learned this fungus from this particular outbreak. So there is a big problem that in this rare group of infection, we are not knowing the epidemiology because in the world literature, there is hardly anything is there. And laboratory diagnosis is challenging because you have to, if your mind knows, then your eye can see about it. We don't know the antifungal breakpoint, so antifungal susceptibility remains a challenge and we require more number of reference laboratory. In case of mold infection also, we have conducted this study in multicentrics. And you can see the infection rate is quite high in this group of patients in India. But problem is, you see that mortality is very high. Even those who are treated, there is also not a very significant decrease in mortality. So we need to diagnose them much earlier. And we used to know that aspergillus is the commonest one. Yes, it is also commonest. But what we have seen is that mucorels is also very important in case of India. You see, if we add this 25 accepted IP, you can see mucormycosis possibly one quarter of the cases in here. Now, gynecologists, you know, this recurrent candida vaginitis is a big issue, but we are not taking care of this. Just two days back, one of the ID specialists called me from Ahmedabad and said, sir, I have a big problem. My patients are repeatedly coming back with the same candida valvovaginitis, how will you manage? How many of you have worked in this area? This is a big challenge in case of India that need to be taken care of. Ophthalmologists, our, in, in India, the farmers are getting injured while working in the field and they generally don't think of fungal infection. So it has been estimated that over a million population in the world getting blind because of fungal keratitis. ENT surgeon, I'm now they're very busy with mucormycosis, but I have highlighted this, or our team had highlighted it from North India, 1.4% adults suffer from chronic rhinosinusitis and 8.1% of fungal rhinosinusitis. That means one in thousand population. Coming to the surgeons, it's a new issue is coming up. 
intra-abdominal abscess because of fungi, secondary peritonitis, infected pancreatic necrosis, cholecystitis, primary peritonitis. But here the problem is, there's a mixed infection which have been seen in more than 50,000 cases. And the blood culture positivity is not very high. That's why diagnosis is a bit challenged. What we have studied in our acute pancreatitis, we found 7% of them are because of fungus. Another thing which also surgeons have to face is the cuteness mucormycosis, post-trauma, roadside accident, or post-contaminated intramuscular injection, cuteness mucormycosis, which is there. So friends, I would say that we are all in a crossroad. Medical mycology is in crisis. Human fungal infection is a big problem. We have seen these two particular outbreak already are still going on, candida auris and mucormycosis. We also have seen very peculiar thing, never seen earlier. Cryptococcus gatai, a fungus in the tropical area, caused outbreak in the temperate area. And the USA people could date now how it had gone by years after years, getting used to it from Brazil, going up to the Vancouver Island. Another interesting thing observed recently is that it's against the central dogma of fungal infection. We generally used to believe all our dimorphic fungal disease we acquire from the environment. But now this cat transmitted sporotrichosis is causing a big issue in case of Brazil is started, now whole South America. This is a new species that is sporotrichosis brasiliensis causing this infection. So we have a big issue, but we have got limited diagnostic facility. We have gap in awareness in the low and middle income country, but I am a positive thinker. I see always there is light at the end of the tunnel because Data General of Indian Council Medical Research has now agreed to develop 25 reference centers in different states of our country within five years. Already, there are eight centers which is coming up. Also, by our advocacy along with the GAFI, we could do that major tests are now in the essential diagnostic list of WHO. Even majority of the antifungals are also included in the essential medicine list of WHO. The GLASS program, you know, the Global Antimicrobial Surveillance Program, which is going on for bacteria. Now fungus has entered in it. The target point 10 is the fungal susceptibility, which we have already started looking into. Now the question is, why, why, what happened? Why is the reason for these changes happening? I would say multiple factors are there. One of them, of course, overuse of antibiotics. That has disrupted the gut microbiota, and that's a very important issue in case of candida. Antifungal misuse and fungicide use in agriculture, because of that azole resistance as per just communicators come up. Imported tulip bulb from Netherlands reached the Ireland from which it had been seen the same as all resistance as per just fumigators was isolated. But I would say this is the major issue in case of fungi. You know, human temperature is 37, environmental is around where fungi grow is around 25. So we don't get the infection so commonly. This is a thermal restriction zone. But because of this global warming, the fungi are getting adapted to the higher temperature. So the pillars on which the resistance of fungal disease was lying, one is of course by immune separation it breaks, but now this climate change is also playing an important role. Then there is the human migration. People within no time reach from one end of the earth to the other. That's happened that this Japanese person from Vancouver Island going into the Japan, carried this outbreak strain in Japan. Other factors are biofilm, morphogenetic switching, genome organization, and acquisition of blueness. I would say that this change happened in the three determinants of epidemiology. Whenever we discuss epidemiology, we say of host, we say of fungus, we say of endowment. In the host, we are seeing new risk group. 
Even in the immunosuppressed group, we are seeing more immunosuppression, immune modifying drugs are being used, more divisives, and in the fungus, newer species are emerging, causing human infection, and in the environment, construction, demolition in the hospital, natural disaster, all this playing important. So again, coming back to my topic of major relevance in your practice. I now like to highlight these three major agenda which is there now in India. One is the candida oris infection, affecting different patient groups of the hospital, especially in ICU. Mucormycosis, especially the COVID associated mucormycosis, which is a CAM. This can affect any of the clinical group, whether it is rhinocerebral, ENT, eye, pulmonary, pulmonary physician, internal medicine people, gastrointestinal, cuteness, renal disease. Of course, we need to discuss of the antimicrobial stewardship because that's a big goal from WHO. I would lastly like to discuss a bit in case of optimization of the management of the three diseases which all the clinicians are facing. First, come to the candida oris. Since this is very, very peculiar. One fungus started behaving like a bacteria, which never used to happen earlier. It is developing resistance very fast, easily transmitted, was severe infection, high mortality. It's a resilient pathogen, survives many disinfectant, desiccation, and high soil. It contaminates the environment very fast, not easily identified. Widespread globally, already reported from 42 countries. The story started from Japan and Korea in 2008, but when people have looked into all their culture collection, those who have maintained, they found that original first case could have been gone back up to 1996 in South Korea. In India, the disease came in 2009, especially started from Calcutta. But till something reaches to Europe or USA, people then pay much attention. So when it reached in US in 2013, New York Times is one of the most important paper for the globe to say something, and then people start thinking about it. I asked my journalist friend, when we discussed this in 2013, you didn't pay any attention, but when it came in 2019 in New York Times, you started contacting us. This is the problem in case of our developing country. We don't have the confidence of ourselves. But whatever it might be, because of this Tom Chiller, his article has brought the attention in such way that first time one of the fungus had been qualified in the urgent threat category along with the carbapenem resistant bacteria in the CDC drug organism list. So Indian Council Medical Research first time also issued advisory they have said that if there is any pandemia or is infection, please contact the reference laboratory at Chandigarh. But friends, we lost sight of candida oris. COVID-19 not only candida oris, it overshadowed every other disease. But candida oris didn't remain hidden. It started appearing in US, Mexico, even in case of the India. To a great extent, it happened because of the lapses of infection control. We became complacent. We found, we, we found ourselves are protected because we are wearing gloves. So we are not washing our hand. That is a big issue. And because of this, this is spreading. Now, if you look into this candida oris, this was the study which we have conducted that time in 2011, 2012, when we have shown that out of 1400 blastim isolate, this was sixth in ranking order. Candida oris is 5.2%. But last year, what we found, this is from the Delhi, we also worked with them. We found candida oris is now the rank first in order amongst all species of candida causing blood infection. So the question is how to identify candida oris? Yes, commercial phenotypic system cannot help. So we have to have MALDI or the sequencing. Do you have MALDI in all labs? No. Do you have sequencing in all labs? No. So recently, what we could develop from our lab, this particular agar, YPD agar, comprising with 
12.5% sodium chloride and ferrous sulfate incubated at 42 degrees centigrade. What we found that candida oris could be identified within 48 hours, 96% and 100% by 72 hours. Please practice this. That would be a very important issue. We all like to get rid of candida oris. How we can get rid of the candida oris in the hospital? First, we need to know which are the people are colonized, where they are getting colonization. Usually people used to think this is the axilla and groin, but this paper came from USA <coughs> last year. It showed that even compared to axilla groin, it is the nears, like in Staphylococcus carriage, it is also carried in the nears, which is a problem. But this is a very recent paper in Nature and Medicine, which shows that it is not only the axilla groin or the nears, even it is perianal skin, palm, fingertips, inguinal trees, toe waves, all of these, they are staying there. So how we can get rid of candy oris from the hospital? One thing is that, of course, we need to do the hand washing practice. And one good thing is that even alcoholic rub can take away the candy oris. But in case of patient, how we can do chlorhexidine body wash can help, but you need a personalized bathing. That is a very important issue. Still few remains colonized for months, not clear how to get rid of them from the nearest. Separate this patient and need continuous visit. So another issue is that possibly if you, if you cure and colonize patient in your hospital, we need to stop entry of the candia or is colonized patient. Mostly you are in tertiary care hospital where from the secondary care or other hospital patients are referred coming to your eyes. So I was just trying to look into, can it be helped by this particular media, which really helps in this case of identification. This chromogenic other media shown that yes, it can to certain extent can identify, but it would take 24 to 48 hours. Can you keep your patient when he's coming to a hospital first time from another hospital, keep for separately for 24 to 48 hours. I don't think that is possible. So this is the technique which is coming up. I have not evaluated yet, but you can look into this issue. This is a kit which have been come up with a real-time PCR system, which can identify candida oris over one to one and a half hours. Going to the next issue, mucormycosis, storm on Indian sky. It's not only in Indian media, Throughout the globe, it had been highlighted. And first time a disease which had been put as a notified disease list. Till yesterday, government portal said nearly 41,000 cases of mucormycosis are there. But at the same time, the same uh, government portal mentioned it is very likely that actual figures are considerably higher than this. 28 provinces reported the cases. Maharashtra has got the highest number till yesterday they have 9,000 cases. In our institute, we have got 451 cases which are there. Why, where from it had come? My dad hypothesis. Some says industrial oxygen, some says humidifier water, some says contaminated mass, some says zinc supplementation, iron, many things have been said about. It. But I would say that at least these four things which is quite interestingly being found one is the steroid overuse. And second thing is that there is the environment use, the diabetes issue, and of course, the COVID itself can be a problem. So last year, we conducted this particular study, which have been maximum discussed because this is much more conclusive and evidence-based. Rest alert, you can think about other methods for spreading the disease, but I would say you need to prove it. What first in this, this is a 16 center study, which had shown compared to 2019, there was a twofold increase in candia as in case of mucormycosis, which was there. And it had been seen more in case of the male patients. This was the prevalence 0.27% of all COVID patients and 1.6% in treated in ICU. 86% of them are nasovital. And one fourth of them have already brain involvement. So they are coming late to the hospital. 
nearly 9% is pulmonary, which is there. Diabetes is around two thirds and steroid was seen in around 8%. But in one third, COVID alone was the underlying disease and 80% of them received steroid. This particular issue is very important. Majority of them, they have diagnosed more than eight days after the COVID diagnosis. And median time, 18 days. This is the water flow curve, which shows that median time, 18 days after that, so that the patient gets discharged, gone home, and then they develop this COVID pneumoconiosis. By multivariate analysis, we have shown your hypoxia is also important, but this is the most significant factor inappropriate. But there was no media report then. And what happened now? What happened in this second wave? I don't have full explanation for this, but with our conclusive evidence that diabetes and steroid important factor and possible narration which I could gather from the different doctors who have treated, we can build up a story how and why in the second wave such high in number. First thing is that, yes, diabetes was always in India high in number. But what happened during this second wave? So many number of patients came in the hospital. Doctors who have seen the patient in the corridor or in the pavement also. So they don't have the time for glycemic control of this patient. As there was oxygen crisis, they went on giving steroid higher and higher. Six milligram dexas should be maximum given per day for five to 10 days, whereas they have gone up to 30 milligram dexa. 30 milligram dexa means nearly 200 milligram of penicillin daily. Can you imagine what is the amount? Along with that, because of this given steroid, the blood sugar has gone through roof. I have seen patients where the mucormycosis has come with blood sugar of more than 800. Can you imagine? Blood sugar more than 800, 600. This all happened because a high dose of steroid. Of course, environment play an important role because in two studies we have shown that both in case of the indoor and outdoor environment in India, we have very high score counts of mucorels in the air. But we are not very sure how COVID is playing the role. At, the, at present, we know COVID is damaging the pancreatic cell. Two studies have come up. Very recently, both these studies have shown beta cell of the pancreas get damaged. So because of that, insulin production is going down. That is a big issue. How other things can be explained, how it is affecting innate immunity, we still need to do the study. So the story is like this, both indoor and outdoor, we have high score count. Generally, we don't suffer from it, but when we have COVID, and if you have diabetic with the high steroid therapy, then the iron metabolism gets discharged, uh, disturbed, and there is endotheliitis in the small vessels, which are shown in autopsy, and this has shown that how mucor can gain into. So COVID-associated mucormycosis is there. I've not gone into the, the detail of this area. We have discussed in several meetings of it, what are the other possibilities, but I would say those who are young people sitting here, I would say certain areas still have unknown questions and we need to really look into this. Like how this COVID-19 disturbs the mucor specific immunity. Is it that the new variants are causing more disturbance? In case of the fungus, we need to know whether the present species of rhizopods, which is we are isolating, are more virulent, whether the Indian patients are more susceptible. At least now we have already studied, we need to publish it very soon. Industrial oxygen humidifier and mask are not important issues. But I'm not dogmatic. We are still looking to the other environmental factors which might be important for this outbreak. But one thing is very, very clear. Fungal infection is relevant to all group of patients, all group of physicians. Mucormycosis can just elaborate the same thing. Here, you need a team of doctors to handle these patients, ENT specialists, eye specialists, surgeons, dentists, because this time first we have seen the maxillary teeth are getting affected, especially the molar teeth are getting loosened. 
pulmonary physician, IG specialist, neurosurgeon, plastic surgeon, and of course, my poor microbiologist and pathologist, they also need to be relevant in this group. Third issue is that antimicrobial stewardship program. WHO says in their integrated health approach, these are the three pillars. Out of this, one important pillar is the antimicrobial stewardship program, which is there. But friends, in 2017, we all together said delivering antimicrobial resistance agenda not possible without improving fungal diagnostics. If there is sepsis, is it fungal sepsis or bacterial sepsis? That's a big problem. What drug to be given because of that, that's important. Inaccurate diagnosis of fungal sepsis resulting in inappropriate use of antibacterial, antifungal, or antifungal resistance. Even if we plan for antifungal stewardship, which is the definition of antifungal stewardship, right antifungal, right patient, right time, right dose, right route, causing less harm to the patient. Can it be possible without diagnosis? Nothing can be done in, without diagnosis. And we know that delay in diagnosis increases the mortality in candida, aspergillus, mucor, everywhere it has been shown. So what are the modalities for diagnosis? We are still lying with the conventional diagnosis. After imaging, it is the microscopic culture or histopathology. Of course, we have now improved our sample collection from deeper tissue, fiber optic bronchoscopy, EBUS technique. We are getting biopsy, non-bronchoscopic lava samples, city-guided open lung biopsy. But these are all these conventional techniques are of low sensitivity. There are some improvements are there, like MALDI had come. We have some biomarkers. We have some point of care tests which have come. But look into this invasive candidiasis is one of the simplest thing which should have been diagnosed. Even there, the blood culture positivity is not more than 50%. So people try to do this by different type of clinical score, colonizing index, candida score, predictive group. All these are taking some of the clinical factors. But if you see in India, when it had been studied, we found that 95% of our ICU patients are already colonized by candida. So then we have to treat all the 95% patients with antifungal. It's not possible. Similarly, candida score and predictive rule has the major problem. So majority will be on antifungal therapy if we follow this. Why have to do that? I would rather say, if we can do a good blood culture with 40 ml of blood, and that would really can improve the diagnosis. Yes, now the T2, T2 magnetic resonance imaging technique or this nanoparticle-based technique has improved the turnaround time within three to four hours. Back tech takes two days or one and a half days, but here within three to four days, you can do it. But drawback is it only can identify five candida species. Already I have told you in India, we have got 31 species cannot do the susceptibility and cost is astronomical. One test costs $300. Even in Europe, people are not able to identify. At least I would say that identification is very important where both bacteria and fungi are helped by having this multi. It not only identify, possibly in very soon we can perform the susceptibility testing and outbreak investigation. Of course, biomarker can be used. Out of the four biomarker, I would say most important is the beta glucan Though beta glucan is important, very few centers are utilizing this. But at least if you see this study, which had been done in South India in Apollo Chennai, they have shown that if there is less than 80 picogram, even if you have started empiric therapy, you can stop it. If it is more than 150 picogram, that is more specific for invasive cancer. Coming next to the group is pulmonary aspergillus. This is a real challenge group, how to identify or going to diagnose. You know, after the inhalation of the conidia, first there is colonization, then there is hyphae formation, and this hyphae first face these macrophages, and slowly there is a bronchoalveolar dissemination. And they try to enter the blood vessel, and during entry of the blood vessel, it is the neutrophil which prevents this entry, 
that is most important so what we see in case of the neutropenia there is possibility of angioinvasion because absence of neutrophil but in non neutrophilic patient it remains as a bronchoalveolar dissemination so when you say this hello sign or ear piercing signs these are all linked with this thrombosis and infarction so this is very specific for diagnosing in imaging wise but you need a neutropenic patient but already i have mentioned that this disease is seen now in non neutropenic especially in case of icu patient in copd patient in patients who are having cirrhosis and several other factors which have been there so what you can do is that certainly these are not very characteristic sign but like if you get some localized bronchiectasis three in bad appearance like this or if there is central volar micronodules this can also start thinking can it be aspergillus of course hello sign is important in case of the immunosuppressed group or the neutropenic group where it can help in that so friends where we are now you know current diagnostic methods of empiric and targeted therapy when there is clinical infection but we like to identify when the fungi enter that is the biological infection here possibly our these biomarkers that may help existing biomarker are serum galactomannan bl galactomannan serum beta deglutarin but many new biomarkers are coming and that may really help in case of aspergillus diagnosis friends this is one way of categorizing the fungal infection invasive mold infection in case of the patients this has been first qualified by the hematologist group they said that we can have proven infection if it is shown in the tissue we can qualify in the probable group if there is host factor clinical factor and microbiological factor now this has been modified where we have added some of the t cell or b cell immunosuppressant because these are now being commonly used as immunomodulator which are also causing increasing this aspergillus or mucomycosis infection acute drug versus host disease has also been included even wedge shaped or segmental lobar consolidation has been included aspergillus pcr has also been included. but when i am going to the icu first the host factor is not there host factor is the immunosuppression so how we can go for it for this proven is okay but how probable or putative group we can think about it. so here it is said that if there is aspergillus positive in respiratory tract culture later we have included the galactomannan or pcr positive here we have brought out this signs and symptoms at least one of them fever recubescent fever pruritic rub or worsening respiratory symptom and if there is host factor semi quantitative if there is aspergillus culture positive and if there is imaging just now i have shown in non neutropenic what are the imaging shadows which can be there this has been modified by basetti He had said that in host factor now we have got COPD, decompensated cirrhosis, severe influenza. Influenza is very interesting. Post influenza there is high number of cases of invasive aspergillosis now shown. Nearly one quarter of the patient who are admitted in ICU they develop this invasive aspergillosis. But here again the host factor is not there. So how to go for it? There is. good number of cases where tracheobronchitis has been shown if it is tracheobronchitis <coughs> by bronchoscopy you can collect the sample and can do but in other cases it is the galactomannan which really helps if it is positive then you can go for probable case now we have point of care test two test method at com one for detecting galactomannan other is for the protein now in multicentric study in india we are trying to evaluate both this technique how much it can be used for now when covid came there is another term came that is other than influenza associated pulmonary aspergillosis we have got this term called covid associated pulmonary aspergillosis you see in both of these there is host factor is negative for urtc mst so what we can see here of course tracheobronchitis is seen large number of patient 
but in COVID as we say, Prepanway as per just in very few cases. You see, these are the two shadows which have been shown of the city. I would say one of them is aspergillosis and another is not aspergillosis. But can you distinguish? Both of them is very difficult to distinguish. So what we have said is that multiple pulmonary nodule or lung cavitation, refractive fever, or these are the symptoms if it is present on CRV. If you can do the BL sample, that is best, but in COVID people are worried to collect the BL sample, serum galactomanan is not so good. So this is the guideline which we have developed from European Corporation of Medical Mycology and SHAM together. And here in this guideline, we have said in tracheobronchitis, if proven is, of course, we know, and probable, if there is clinical features like this, that is ulceration, serum MNM, and if there is serum galactomanan more than 0.5 or BL galactomanan more than one, then you diagnose. But in case of pulmonary, problem is to collect the sample. So we have brought out a new uh, method of non-bronchoscopic lavas technique. We said if it is non-bronchoscopic lavas, it should have an index of at least 4.5. You can go through this particular paper, Lancet Infectious Disease, detail you can get. Lastly, I would say that algorithm for mucormycosis, where you know these are the risk factors. If there is persistent fever, think about whether there is sinusitis there or not. If there is no sinusitis even, try to do a thoracic CT and do galactomanan PCR. If both of them come negative and if there is lung lesion, then think about can it be mucormycosis? That is very important issue. I would say that in case of antifungal agents, we have crossed a lot of hurdles. It's no more one apple on the tree. We have many apples on the tree, which we can see. And many things are coming up. Many new drugs are coming up in case of fungal fail. That would be very important. If you see the updates of fungal disease in last three years in case of candida, Attributable mortality has come down. Is it because of improvement of the diagnosis or it can A new drug is coming up, which is well tolerated. In aspergillus, we discussed about chronic pulmonary aspergillosis. New guidelines are coming up for invasive aspergillosis and phobic associated pulmonary aspergillosis, both in Kenya and phobic. There are several guidelines which we are developing in case of this, but there are new risk factors, immunomodulators which are. But lastly, if I see the major challenges in India, there is still high burden issue, limited awareness issues. The topic which I have discussed, the relevance of fungal infection in clinical practice, not recognized, low resource allocation, public health response is poor, epidemiology is difficult to understand, and the research is still limited. So friends, what we need, one is awareness. The awareness required in case of healthcare workers. The awareness is required in the government in case of the patient. Second important thing is the laboratory infrastructure. We need the training also. The training for the clinician and laboratory staff. We need the research in this field of fungal disease and we need the availability and affordability of the equipment. I would say the key players internationally are the three. This GAFI, Global Action Fund for Fungal Infection, European Confederation of Medical Mycology, and my own International Society of Human and Animal Mycology. The one important thing, GAFI is playing role in case of awareness and a lot of advocacy in other areas. Whereas European Confederation is giving stress in case of laboratory development and training. Whereas ISHAM is playing multiple role in awareness, laboratory infrastructure, and training. So what we can see major thing is that now these three associations are playing together. Friends, the same thing is expected from Indian Society of Medical Microbiologists, Psychologists, SIRS, Fungal Infection Study Forum, and Indian Association of Medical Microbiologists. To achieve this target, we have to work miles ahead. How we work, it is your choice, but you have to work for miles to achieve this target. 
So friends, summarizing what I tried to tell you is that think of fungus infection. Fungus infection are important in clinical practice. Please do not neglect it. The prevalence is high in India, especially in tropical countries. New host, new fungi, environment is making the situation complex. We know of this candida oris and mycosis problem. We need to do something very early. Early diagnosis, prompt therapy is very important. Training required in diagnosis among the lab workers and management of clinicians. So here, awareness and improvement of diagnostic laboratory are major unmet needs. I would say that ICMR is taking role. Fungal infection study program is taking role. Indian Society of Medical Mycology is taking role. Clinical infectious disease society is playing role. Of course, our IMM is also playing important role. Infection control and fungal stewardship would require stress. We require advocacy, advocacy, and advocacy. We need collaboration. We need the scientific body's role and funding agency. At last, I invite you to become a member of this international society. You know, if you become a member, we have now a laboratory course, which is free for the members. Those who are not members, it is charged $75. If you can qualify that course, you get a certificate from the International Society. That's very important. And those who are young can learn it. And for clinicians, by the end of this year, the, another course is going to be for the clinician that is already developed by John Parfum. So I would say that if you become a member, you get a lot of advantage. And here the membership fee is only $50. And those who are less than 40 years, that is $35 only per annum. Finally, the uh, conference which we are going to held, which was supposed to be in 2011, postponed, postponed, and postponed. Now it is the final date, 20 to 24 September 2022. The first time the international conference is going to happen here. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, sir. It has to be a standing ovation. I think every each and every one of us need to give as many claps as possible. So, so sir, please consider it as a standing ovation. This was a brilliant, excellent, comprehensive uh, talk on the clinical relevance of fungi. So the motto of our institute, uh, the vision statement itself is Vidyanu Rugvye Muktaye. Through knowledge, we shall conquer. Through awareness, we can call, you know, the knowledge is important for conquering disease. So we do, uh, keeping up with the theme, uh, we have been organizing uh, the academic programs. Sir, uh, I would like to take the liberty of asking the first question. Uh, sir, my question to you is, uh, you have told us, uh, various organizations who are working towards ensuring the best quality diagnostic services uh, in mycology labs. Sir, can NMC also introduce some uh, minimum requirements to in a medical college for a mycology laboratory? You know, uh, uh, that would have been an interesting question which you have raised. I would have loved earlier I have kept those slides, but then I have moved those because this is more for the clinician. It would have been much useful for the laboratory people. We have given government <coughs> four categories. We have got developed a good document provided to the government that what would be the diagnostic test expected at the PHC level, primary health center level, what is expected at the district hospital level, what is expected in medical college level and what is expected in the uh, reference laboratory level. So we have developed all this. And at present, what we have started is reference lab we are identifying and we have given the, this task for development of other factors so that by training they can develop in each of the state or the province uh, many number of laboratories, especially in medical colleges and all of them. But if I want to discuss, that would be, I can give you a detail of that whole program which you have done and put it to the government. 
Thank you, sir. There are some questions in the chat box. I didn't see any question in the chat box. Uh, Dear delegates, will you please share your question on the chat box? Is there an increase in invasive aspergillosis also in this COVID pandemic? Yes, there is. There is. And Dr. Shuash Todi was supposed to start this study. We planned this study, did everything. But uh, finally, mucormycosis has overwhelmed all of us. It had covered everything, so we hardly get the time for doing this study. But what we are now seeing is very interesting. I don't know, uh, all of the centers are looking or seeing the same thing. Like suppose if I see uh, of the so-called rhinocerebral infection, at least in 20 cases, one or two cases is because of aspergillus. There are five percent cases where both aspergillus and mucor are uh, mixed infection, but there are few cases where it is the aspergillus, not mucor, is involved. So I'm saying you, uh, nothing is. Uh, there are a lot of things we need to do. Uh, no fungi can really be spared in this area uh, if we try to look into this. Even black mycelial fungus. We have seen few cases of black mycelial fungus causing this. But of course, predominant is the mucormycosis. So I would say that aspergillus, lung infection is going up, especially in case of the uh, Omri Hospital, Calcutta, then in Angaram Hospital, then Atul in case of uh, Ahmedabad. Even Rajiv has said about this, several discussion is going on, but we need to have a study on this area. So there is a question which uh, is, does sunlight play a role in reducing fungal spores in environment and make a difference in indoor and outdoor air? See, the thing is that what we have seen in the summer, uh, different months we have studied this, summer months, rainy season, winter months, and even in autumn, there is no difference we found in case of the uh, spore counts in different seasons. So I would not say that this is a very much significant difference is there. Of course, in during the uh, early uh, or late rainy season, the infection of these organs increases, spore counts increases more. But I would say that we have no clear cut difference which we have seen. Uh, even uh, two days back, I was uh, having a session in Dubai I asked them to look into because Dubai has got very hot environment outside. But you know, this mucor spores, they can withstand up to 50 degree temperature. They, they, they are uh, uh, really withstand very high temperature. So these spores can persist in that sense. But whether there is count is going down or not, that we need to look in more center study. Uh, we did a study from our center in multiple places, but the uh, multicentric study would be more strength. So where do you see the molecular diagnostics in early uh, diagnosis of invasive fungal infections? See, the thing is that this would be the PCR thing. The PCR in case of fungi, the problem is the environment is full of spores. So you need to have so much of the controls that's why it is not possible to run such a facility in case of a, uh, even in medical colleges. I would say that even in medical colleges, uh, we don't have so much of uh, clean room facility. And there would be a big problem in case of giving false positive report. So I'm a bit scared about this particular molecular technique for PCR for diagnosis. But of course, this point of care test, which is a closed system, possibly can help more uh, in diagnosis, but it needs to be evaluated in more centers. Even in case of beta D glucose, very recently I've got very multiple experience in COVID-19 patient, uh, beta D glucose VIPs in two, three occasions very recently happened. Uh, the beta-D glucan had shown from a lab more than 600. 
and it was said that immediate therapy should be given uh, for this, but the patient has no symptom. So we collected the sample from that VIPs and brought to our lab and performed the test. We found that the beta D glucon is even less than 20. So I'm trying to say that uh, people may start a test if you don't have a good laboratory for performing both galactomannan and beta D glucon. I'm a bit scared uh, to open in any center. Uh, there would be a problem if you don't have, because you need a very dedicated, uh, this, uh, uh, there is biosafety wood, which only performs this test, nothing else. So this type of system is required. So the postgraduates want to know if there is any course which they can do in uh, medical mycology to pursue this post MD. I said that this particular uh, course, which you have started, this is quite extensive course. It is over two to three months. Uh, people have to go through this course in case of laboratory people, which is working. And this is 16 module there. And each module, and this is uh, accredited from the European so Society of Accreditation. So this course is very much, uh, very much accredited. And this course, if you go through it, at the end, you have to appear in an exam. If you qualify, uh, then you get a qualified certificate. And if you cannot qualify, at least we say that you have participated in it. So that is there. And for the clinicians who are attending, I would say that by the end of this year, uh, the e-course for the clinicians is almost ready. Uh, this would be also coming out very soon. So here, if you are ISHA member, I would say that it is to become a SHAM member is only those who are postgraduate less than 40 years, only $35. And this course is free for the SHAM members. And those who are non SHAM members, the course fee is also not very high. It is only $75. So you can run through that course. That's course I have gone through. I've seen myself, it's a very interesting course. And that really helps in case of uh, getting a lot of knowledge in case of fungal, uh, in case of laboratory diagnosis. Sir, uh, is there time for two, three more questions? So there are two, three more questions. One is, of course, is culture for mucor mycosis okay or we need to confirm with molecular diagnosis? See, the thing is that if you are, I would say that still direct microscopy is very important. A lot of people are, this time I have come across many clinicians asking me, the lab has not seen fungi on the direct microscopy, but it is, uh, culture is showing mucor. You know, fungi is present so much in the environment. Until unless you see it on direct microscopy, I'm not very confident. I would rather say that when culture is positive, go back to your slide, look into the microbe slide again or prepare another smear and check it again. Uh, I would rather confidently give the report if the direct microscopy is also positive. At least in our center, we have found almost 95 to 97% we could do the correlation well. There is no problem. So uh, that's a problem in case. This time I learned so much of the whole country like uh, there is a doctor from Bareilly called me and said that uh, uh, we are seeing such type of patient, but we don't have any mycology laboratory here. And nobody looks into the fungus. Uh, we all have our attention in elite city like Mumbai, Pune or Delhi, Chandigarh like this. But uh, what is happening in case of our other city, like suppose Allahabad, what is happening in Bareilly? What is happening in Kanpur? What is happening in your uh, Maharashtra and other like Nasik or many of those places? Uh, there is the diagnosis, how you can go ahead with case of fungal diagnosis. So this is a real problem in our country. Uh, we have only seen the tip of the iceberg in everything. Uh, we need to do a lot in this area. But I would say that those who are here, microbiologists, here are there, I would request them to become a clinical microbiologist. What I have found over the years is that as a microbiologist, 
I could play more as a role of a clinician if you can really handle or discuss this with the patient well. So that is the very important because your microbiology skill with the clinical skill can combine together for managing the patient. Madam, can I just uh, uh, thank her for the... Yeah. Uh, so uh, actually, it was your master class. I mean, uh, so how beautifully you, you encapsulated the whole topic in a nutshell, and we are just overwhelmed. And the messages we are receiving on the chat box and uh, on personal also, sir, absolutely overwhelmed. Thank you so much. I think uh, you have increased the awareness among us microbiologists as well as the clinicians who are participating. Many filled within uh, so about one and a half hour session. Can't thank you enough, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So there are a couple of questions, but I think uh, we have really uh, stepped over our time. But it was a, a absolutely uh, a remarkable session which we had for about one and a half hours. And I'm actually short of words. Sir, uh, Dil Mange more. we definitely would like you to come back soon and uh, give us another talk and enlighten us with all the recent updates. And for all the postgraduate students, please, uh, you can enroll in any of these online courses and uh, you can definitely hone your skills. And uh, in fact, time has come that you understand all the diagnostic procedures which are required for mycology in a standard microbiology laboratory and bring out as much as is possible uh, from the lab, which is required for patient care. With these few uh, concluding remarks, once again, from the Dean, Director of Medical Education and Department of Microbiology, I express my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arunalok Chakravarti for giving us this very lucid and comprehensive talk on fungal infections of clinical relevance. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you each and every one of you for participating in this academic session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoy it very much. If anyone has any question, they can send me those questions. Uh, somebody is asking, trying to ask some question. You've, uh, you can carry on this uh, last question if you... Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, somebody... Uh, the last question, let me just see, sir. Someone is trying to ask. Yes. Please carry on. In long-term COVID patients who land up in post-COVID complications like thromboembolism, what is the advisable sample and its relevance if suspecting fungal infections in the absence of negative uh, and bacterial cultures are also negative. I think thromboembolism, if you have seen thromboembolism in the small vessels, if it is affecting the heart or any organ, that is a different manifestation altogether. But from the fungal point of view, if you have to say about it, yes, people can cause a problem. Uh, very recently, I have discussed some of the patient's problem. Like, suppose I never heard these things happen. Now, multiple cases I have heard that the uh, lower end of tibia, lower end of the tibia is getting closed because of mucor, along with the blood vessel. They are going. There is osteomyelitis because of mucor. So I'm trying to say is that we need to learn a lot about this particular fungus. Uh, we never heard so much of the bone involvement in case of this mucormycosis. So I would say that in case of well, the question, I'm not very clear what it has been asked. If it is a thromboembolism, thromboembolism can cause the problem in case of the infarction or problem in case of the different organs where it is going. But if it is fungus-related, fungus-related thromboembolism uh, generally occurs in case of aspergillus and mucor. And that can occur wherever this embolus which they produce infarction and necrosis. And there is the problem which happens. That's why uh, it is much easier
to manage mucor before entering the blood vessel. Once it enters the blood vessel, it is very, very difficult. That's why we are seeing the mortality so high in case of mucor mycosis. So today's newspaper talks about an 11-year-old boy from Kerala who died due to mucor mycosis. That's not very unusual. Even in case of a pediatric patient, we are seeing the same thing uh, which is happening. This time, so many problems, not only in case of the diagnosis, drug problem, and so many other issues came together. It was unprecedented. Nobody heard about so many cases of mucormycosis ever in this country. So if there are any further questions, you can please send it across to sir. He will be happy to answer. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Much. Thank you all, everyone, for participating. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Program Director Dr. Jayanti Shastri and thank you so much Dr. Arun Loke Chakravati for this wonderful session sir. Thank you so much all. I'll just end up the session.